Ah, good evening. Good evening and welcome to Talking Songs with me, Roland Jones. How are we doing today? Um, I don't know what it's like where you are, but um, where we are, it's gone grim again. You know, they say it's grim up north. Well, it certainly is today, I'm afraid. Um, but we're still trying to smile our way through it. And um, hopefully we can cheer you up with a, a, a bit of music. Um, have I got any news for you today? No, I don't think I do, really. But um, anyway, this is a song. This is a song I did um, I recorded a couple of years ago. Um, and um, it's called New Start, New Day. I think I can, that's all I can say. <laughs> Waking every morning is a scary thing for me Afraid to see the empty space, the one where you used to be Come down to breakfast, no appetite for food Make a pot of coffee, realize I made enough for two I'm looking for a new start, looking for a new day Looking for something that will take my breath away I'm looking for a new start Looking for a new day Looking for something that will take my breath away Pick up a paper Catch the bus No particular hurry Nothing matters very much Find my way without thinking Arrive at my desk Like it seemed Nothing matters much I just couldn't care less I'm looking for a new start Looking for a new day Looking for something That will take my breath away I'm looking for a new start Looking for a new day Looking for something that will take my breath away Eat a burger on my own Lunchtimes ain't much fun Watching couples holding hands Remembering when we were one Stay late at the office It's easy that way Get home, eat, cry myself to sleep Just another perfect day I'm looking for a new start Looking for a new day Looking for something that will take my breath away I'm looking for a new start Looking for a new day Looking for something that will take my breath away I know that I can't go on living my life this way no rhyme, no reason, just an endless day to day. Something's gonna have to give, I'm gonna have to change something in me. But please don't say those words, I hate that there's plenty more fish in the sea. I'm looking for a new start, looking for a new day. I'm looking for something that will take my breath away. I'm looking for a new start. Looking for a new day Looking for something that will take, 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 take my breath away Take my breath away Take my breath away still find it really odd playing to nobody <laughs> right then um so i have with me this evening mr fergus mcneil now some of you out there i'm sure that some of you have been um, um hopefully seen this um posted on the talent is uh, timers site um a lady called shashka decided some time ago to set up something called the the talent is timers competition and it's been a, a group of people and i think there's 1400 people and the um the only criteria is you have to be over 50 
which I clearly got into. And um, and this is a competition, a songwriting competition. And the gentleman who won it is going to join us now. And it's Mr. Fergus McNeil. There you are. Let me put your microphone on. Fergus, good to see you again, mate. Good to see you, Rowan. Thanks to be yeah. here for the invite. Oh, it's all right. Absolute pleasure. Um, so, um, yeah, when did... <sighs> We, we'll talk about the song in, in a minute. You, I, I hope you're going to do that at some stage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, songwriting for you, when did it start? Uh, late. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also just qualifying for the over 50s category by a few years. Um, but yeah, I didn't really start writing songs until well into my 40s. I think it was around about 2013. And I know I can date it to then because uh, it was connected to setting up a charity um, which uh, exists to uh, bring creative practices to criminal justice. Uh, my day job, I should explain, is as a criminologist, and I've grown interested in the role of the arts in criminal justice um, and wanted, along with a few other people, to find fresh ways to spark deeper and richer conversations about crime and punishment. And uh, songwriting is one of the ways that we set out to do that and once we set that up it was made pretty clear to me that I couldn't be a passenger if I was to participate um, <laughs> in that project I had to sort of put myself on the line and and that got me started with creative writing in general and songwriting in particular I hadn't really done any of either well any creative writing since school to be honest until mm -hmm. I started around about uh, 2013 and I haven't really stopped since once I once I started, it was a tap that didn't want to be turned off. So it's just been pretty <laughs> continuous ever since. Yeah, as you say, the, the, the thing about doing creative writing for most people, it, it stops It stops after primary school. Yeah. Um, and I, I read an interesting article by uh, an ed educational psychologist some years ago, and she was saying that we, we learn certain things through education. First of all, we start by saying imagination is not much good, and then it, and then things tell us that pictures aren't any good either. Because so by the time you get to doing your, your O levels or your A levels, you know images are out the window, sort of thing. So you then just learn text. So, uh, yeah. so getting back into it, and and I think these days there's a it, there's a lot more freedom to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of um, you know, <laughs> apart from the last year or so, um, opportunities to go out and, and and play, and also to meet people like this. You know, presumably you had other other people involved in the project who were who were used to doing this sort of work, yeah. Yeah, no, we we used um, freelance musicians from the outset, and there's a really mm. um, dynamic and vibrant music scene in Glasgow. Um, yeah. Sadly, there's uh, scores of brilliant musicians who can't really make a living uh, from from making and releasing their own music. So mm. to supplement their incomes, they do different kinds of community projects, and mm. that's been a great bonus for us because they're also brilliant people practitioners um mm. and really able to draw the creativity out of other people and it's through um getting to know them and working alongside them over the last seven or eight years that um I've, I've learned a huge amount about about how to write myself um obviously some of that's quite structured when we run songwriting workshops in prisons and in communities uh we we take sort of two or three days to help people work towards one song which they'll record in demo form in the mm. session as we call it um and there's lots of exercises that get people from from the blank page to the finished song mm. and obviously i've taken a lot of those activities home and used them <laughs> in, in my own writing uh, so yeah i've been very lucky to be around a, a very um vibrant scene um and yeah very grateful to all the all the musicians and other uh, people who've helped me along the way that's great well would you like to do a song for us now because i've got a question to ask you about can you tell us a bit about this song what's this one well, this is the song that, that won the aforementioned Talent is Timeless <laughs> competition, much to my surprise. And uh, this one was written um, just a couple of years ago. Uh, I think I'd been writing for about five years by that point, and I'd never written anything that referred directly to um, my uh, long-standing relationship with my wife. Um, mm. We've been married for 
well, when was it? Nineteen ninety-two. We Make got sure you get it right, Fergus. Uh, yeah, and and we actually we actually got together on the twenty seventh of December, nineteen eighty nine, which was round about the time that the Berlin Wall was coming down, just to put us in our historic in some sort of symbolic <laughs> note. Yeah. So to, to celebrate the thirtieth anniversary of the first date, in fact, I kind of I wrote and recorded this song uh, for her. So it's a song which basically tries to celebrate uh, uh, enduring love. Um, it might sound at the beginning as if it's about a classic sort of story of falling in love, but if you listen closely, you'll see that the the main message of the song is about um, about how we kind of sustain love and passion over decades. So very hopeful, very optimistic song. <laughs> it's unusual for me, I should say. Uh, the same the same wife refers to my style of music as miserableist, which I think is a fair <laughs> Fair well, it was it was applied to Leonard Cohen when I was at school, so I think it's been going for a long time that expression. So you know, you're in good company, should we say? I think yeah. so. I think that's a reference <laughs> I'll take. Here we go. Have you ever met someone and felt the hectic stirring in your blood? It's hard to tell a pulse of madness from the embryo of love. I still see the scene like yesterday, a turquoise flash among the winter coats. Then later in the library, you smile like spring inviting seeds to grow. That's how it goes. Sometimes the body knows before the mind. I got lost upon the hills, I had to climb so I could find my way. And you did your own traveling on a sticky floor, you danced the blues away. Then in a borrowed car on borrowed time, a turning cheek sparked a question mark. The answer might be a laugh or cry, the letters helped us both unfold the map. That's how it goes. Sometimes the body knows before the mind Blood still stirs within these veins the rush of love still An overpattern carpet laughed out loud and then we took the flight. Magic intermingling in indigo we soared into the night. That's how it goes. Sometimes the body knows before we lose. Our minds blow it still stirs within these veins the rush of love still cold. Your name, the blood 
your name. I feel the same. I feel the same. Great, love it, love it. Um, uh, the miserablest thing. I'm, 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 quite, I'm quite interested in this. I mean, my, my background, I, I started off playing blues and I still tend towards that. Um, but one of the things that I talk to, to most songwriters about, and everybody finds it easier to write sad songs than happy ones. So yeah. come on, you're, you're, a, you're a, a man of academe. Tell me why. <laughs> well, I mean, there's lots of, there's some technical reasons for me, for sure. One is that, as you might have noticed, I'm not, technically very gifted on on rhythm and tempo i have a quite a a difficult time playing in in time and so anything which is more upbeat and complex rhythmically i would just mm. find hard to be to be honest but also i mean personally speaking uh, i like music which explores difficult experiences i find mm. it rich um, and i think it's not an accident that some of the most powerful songs reflect on on difficult experiences. It's a terrible cliche, but mm. it's, it's true. Um, whereas, actually, my my wife her her love of music is is completely the opposite. So she wants music that takes her to a joyful place. She wants to mm. dance. Mm. She's not going to get that from my music, and nobody wants <laughs> it either. So that there's no misspelling here. <laughs> Um, and that's fine. That's it's just I, I'm processing. I, I guess I'm a happy person most of the time, and I'm processing uh, harder or more painful stuff, uh, or or I'm trying to reflect on life. And mm -hmm. it, it it suits a kind of wistful and relatively quiet and thoughtful. I hopeful. That's how I would hopefully describe it. Sort of <laughs> music. Um, but if if you want to cut loose and party, then you want you want different sounds and, and I, mm. I'm not really able to supply them. Mm. Um, but one of the things about like, like I talked about the blues, I mean, a, a lot of the blues was, although it came from um, di incredibly difficult situations, much of it was designed for dancing to, yeah. you know, so the guys who were playing the steel guitars, they liked the steel guitars because they produced so much sound that people could dance to them. Yeah. And, and the, the other thing in the, um, in, in the tradition of the blues is much of the, of the anger which the, the men expressed towards women was actually um, transferred because it was actually the anger the man felt towards their bosses. Yeah. But they couldn't sing about that because they're going to get, you know, whipped and, and beaten and things. Um, yeah. But um, so, so there is still that... Um, that thing about it but yeah I, it, it just fascinates me that we, we are drawn we are drawn to the the darker side as, as it were i mean people have said to me i'm too cheerful to sing the booze the, the booze well, was Friday, <laughs> um <laughs> but do you think um like in 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 some of the lyrics there i mean you use some sort of very classic approaches to, to lyric writing I, I mean apart from doing these workshops have you ever studied i mean you, you've got that lovely thing in there about um um, in a borrowed car on borrowed time, yeah, you know that that sort of repetition is 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 classic. I mean, you hear that in Gershwin and American songbooks. You know, and it, it's it's. I must have just absorbed that somehow by osmosis. That, osmosis, that was, yeah, yes. It wasn't really uh, much thought about. Uh, I mean, well, there, 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 are bits, there are bits in the lyrics that are very, uh, you know, are more carefully constructed than then. There are bits that are that just flow out. Um, mm. I think uh, w one bit of advice I was given by a friend who's a, a both actually a, a great songwriter and musician and also a, a, an academic musicologist. Her name's Jo uh, Collinson Scott is her uh, academic and, and her real name, but her mm. artist name is Jo Mango. She's a fantastic Scottish artist. You should look her up. Mm. But she, um, when I, I think I sent her one of the one of the very first songs that I wrote and recorded, um, which actually was slightly more cheerful in its music. Mm. but very uh, heavy in its lyrical material. But she, she just gave me the advice that sometimes in lyric writing, uh, what you're trying to do is move. You're, you're obviously often conveying, not always, but you're often conveying something of your own experience. And to get into that, mm. you need detail, uh, small mm. details that, that make it real to you. And actually, the more particular and specific that you make it, sometimes the more universal yeah, it becomes. More um, 
So, you know, there are lines in that song which will mean nothing to anybody except me. I mean, a turquoise flash among the winter coats is just that the first time I saw her, mm. it, was in, it was in the cloakroom of the university library. And I don't know that she was wearing turquoise that day, but I remember that she wore turquoise a lot mm. back in the, in the mid 80s. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's, there's lots of lines like that. The borrowed car on borrowed time is just that um, I had borrowed my dad's car to take her <laughs> on our first date. Um, and it was kind of now or never a moment. So it, <laughs> it makes sense. But yeah, I, I guess that, that movement between focusing in describing the, in, in as much detail uh, as possible, something very personal to you, and then finding a way that it might bridge to the experiences of others so that people listening mm. can relate to it and connect with it is is maybe where some of the art or artistry is. Um, mm. so yeah. Yes, it's an interesting. The, the other thing you were saying before about the, um, the, 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 the interpretation of things that are like serious to you and yeah. you in general, us in general, uh, are the ones that we write about. And uh, I had, I, I can't think whether I heard somebody say this or it was a quote from somewhere, but I'm, I'm already trying to work it into a lyric where somebody said that scars last longer than, t la scars last longer than laughter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Und undeniably true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I quite like So, um, so what's the next stage then? What's the next stage of your um, of your your uh, your prized position? Well, the 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 main prize from the competition was that the song uh, I get to go and record the song in Abbey Road, mm. which uh, obviously was the reason that everybody entered the competition. <laughs> uh, it's, we all want to go there, and uh, yeah. I, I've I've never I mean I've recorded. Uh, at home and I've recorded in a, in a friend's home studio um, and I've recorded in some of these songwriting sessions in prison cells and mm. in, in toilets and in <laughs> cupboards, but I've never recorded in, in an actual studio for, for built good. for the purpose. So uh, to, to should be, be able to do that at Abbey Road for the first yeah. time is going to be a bit special. So it looks like we're going down for that in late July mm. and then other aspects of the prize include the the release of that single or record or, or whatever it is that track <laughs> what have they called these days uh, yeah in 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 some form or another um I, i'm not expecting to be hitting the charts it's just nice mm. to get a chance to make it properly uh, yeah with, absolutely with great, with great people around me including sasuke i think will be there to, mm. to hopefully give me some backing vocals um and one of the judges chris gorski is going to be the producer mm. it, it also looks as if i'm going to be able to bring a few musicians that i've been working with in scotland mm. uh, down to, to abbey road with me to provide the the the, the backing band as it were or yeah. most of the backing band so mm. that, that and you are going to sing it yourself I am going to sing it. Yeah. Good. good. Um, I mean, it's... we've got some. We've got some nice comments here from. Uh, there's quite a few people dropped in that names I recognise from the um, talent is time. As there's Trudy who describes you as golden tonsils, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a hello from who else was there? Da, 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 da. Melissa. She's Melissa Rose, and she's on yeah, talent she's... is time. I think. Yeah. She's in Nashville, I believe. Is she? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of my regulars on here. There's Elizabeth and Nev. Good evening to you. Um, who else have I got? That's, that's it so far. But we've got, there's a few guys. <laughs> um, Trudy seems to be writing her messages in twice just to make sure you get them. So, okay, good. Nice one, Trudy. Nice I will one. review them all later, Trudy. You can be sure <laughs> okay, then. Song number two. Okay, um, so this it is... It sounds like Desert Island Discs, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> this is definitely fitting in the miserable category. Uh, <laughs> and um, this is also my most recent song, uh, written actually for this month's uh, monthly challenge on the Talent is Timeless mm. uh, group. So the, the theme was Threshold, which actually was in reference to the charity that I talked about earlier, which is called mm. Vox Liminous, Voices mm. from the Threshold. In Latin, so I was thinking about thresholds, and and I was literally sitting exactly where I am now, with the guitar, um, looking out of the window that I look out of every day while I do my job, um, and thinking about the the kind of inside outside of lockdown, but mm. also thinking about um, 
sliding doors and lives you didn't live and uh, the, the <laughs> thresholds between this world and all the other infinite possible worlds that you might have ended up inhabiting. So inevitably, uh, I, I got to ruminating on uh, a relationship that never happened. And so this song's one of those. Excellent. It's very quiet. <laughs> Delicate. I've been this side of the door so long Looking out my window wondering In the morning I still hear a bird song Still hear low traffic rumbling How could it be so hard to stay Across a once imagined line At night I close my eyes and slip In dreams between your world and mine And then I see you as you were The way the light played on your hair And I recall the question in your eyes I wonder would I still find it there I wonder I wish I'd known you as you've aged Seen how the lines have changed your face And found the answer for your eyes Beyond the tyranny of time and place And then I'd see you as you were The way the light played on your hair And I recall the question in your eyes I wonder, would I still find it there? I wonder, would I still find it there? And then I'd see you as you were The way the light played on your hair And I recall the question in your eyes I wonder, would I still find it there? I wonder, would I still find it there? I wonder, would I still find it there? Great, love it. Yeah. Great stuff. See, Tr Trudy's just put um, a comment here saying, um, with reference to what, what I mentioned about the use of the borrowed. Uh -huh. And she says, um, she said that, well, she said she's put z z Zergma. Uh, yeah, it, it, I think it's, yeah, it, Zergma is the classic example of, of Zergma, as I recollect it, is um, the boy kicked the football with determination on his right foot, um, which, as she says, is the use of the term literally and then metaphorically. Mm. So borrowed time and, bor yeah, I think, oh, I think, I, I think we can yeah. go for that, Trudy. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Trudy. That's uh, that makes me sound really clever. Uh, <laughs> a complete accident, but uh, I love it. And we've got a few more um, um, messages here from um, Kath Harney. Oh yeah. Thank yeah. You. Kath is um, responsible for me entering the competition at all. Oh, well I mean, done, Kath. Well I mean, done, Kath. Hope she gets the credit on the album. 
she she'll get a credit on anything that ever happens. <laughs> when but, you get the Grammy, I'd like to thank Kath and actually it's worth saying, um Kath and I met at online at the Glasgow Songwriting Festival last August, which is uh, a brilliant event run by uh, Finlay Napier, a Scottish mm. folk musician. And it was uh, it was lovely to spend two days um with a group of about I think there was six or seven of us in in the group with Kath and I um and we kind of went round and spent half a day with each of four musician facilitators giving us their songwriting tips so actually the mm. next song by by coincidence uh, uh when when we get to it is one that was written um in that in that workshop so yeah right oh, that's good seamless 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 yeah absolutely it's where we planned it um oh trudy's put here i'm an english teacher right I okay we'll take your word for that well then trudy yeah. um and a message from heidi heidi dewhurst is a, a, a friend friend of ours from manchester and she's she's been on this show and she says i'm much more comfortable writing songs with feeling not necessarily sad but always contemplative yeah, that's good. I like that. a good word, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> adopt that rather than miserableist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Miserable I'm just trying to think. The miserableist was also referred. Um, oh, how else was it pointed at? Oh, oh, it'll come back to me. Um, anyway, so you you seem to have been involved a, a lot in these sort of songwriting things. I mean, you, you've, you've mentioned another one there that, that you did with Kath. Um, I have to say it's nothing that, that I've ever, ever been involved with. I've never, never, I've never come across them at the right time. Although I did do the thing on the songwriting Academy last week, which was quite interesting. Um, but um, do, do you think they are, I mean, presumably you, you, you would actually advocate them as a way of yeah, no, I, improving I, I, technique. So the the reason I went the, the 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 reason I went to the Glasgow Songwriting Festival mm. was that I wanted to go to one such event where I had no responsibility for organising it or for for facilitating <laughs> it. And yeah. Every every workshop or seminar I'd ever been in before then, I'd been there as somebody who was responsible in some sense yeah. for the project. Um, and although although I still managed to write songs in in many of those. Um, we call them Vox sessions. So Vox, mm. the organization, the sessions is just yeah. our term. Um, and I, I would very often write a song in those sessions, um, kind of guided by the exercises that everybody was going through together. Um, and sometimes with a little bit of input and support from the musician facilitators. But I went to the, the Glasgow Songwriting Festival to, to be able to kind of leave all that behind me and be utterly uh, selfish in, in <laughs> a couple of days of protected time and space where I could just enjoy for myself yeah. the process of trying to create something. Um, and I, I really did thoroughly enjoy it. I think, you know, there's lots to be learned from people who have done songwriting a, a great deal, obviously, and, and successfully, as, mm. as the facilitators often have. But there's also just something about putting the time aside and committing to trying to produce something in that time. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you know what it's like here with life. My, my life is very busy with a very full-time job and uh, teenage kids. And, mm. um, and so it, it felt like a fabulously indulgent luxury to, to put two mm. days aside. And I actually got three songs out of the two days mm. uh, that, that are, okay uh you know and you know okay it's, it's taken a few months after to to work uh the next one the one i'm going to play next mm. into a shape that i'm happy with one was produced on the first morning of the workshop it's called water song and it's mm. up on, on my youtube Is this about the river yeah it's up yeah, on the, like on, yeah, on the right. channel and it, it uh it came out in that form almost instantly within the first mm. half hour of that workshop it was it was an unusually uh, quick song, um, but this uh, the Stanley Brown, the song I'm going to do next, uh, the lyrics were more or less completed in the workshop, but I've been through about four tunes for this, <laughs> for these words, trying to find uh, something that worked for me and for the words, uh, mm. and ended up with with where I am now. I'm not sure the song's quite finished, but it's it's shareable. So, but I, I think one of the things you said about um, you know to, to to get sort of completely involved in these things. I mean, I, I have I've not been to songwriting workshops, but I, I have been to when I was um, 
heavily into jazz. I went on quite a few jazz weekends and things where yeah. basically you'd go somewhere, walk into a, I mean, there was one which was amazing. I went into a hotel and we, we arrived there at sort of six o'clock on a Friday evening and we did nothing but play or talk about music until we left at six o'clock on the Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you come out just buzzing. Absolutely. And, and we get that in the, in the songwriting sessions in prison. Yeah, but... Often the, the facilitating group go away and are residential for a couple of days. And obviously the, the time in the prison is pretty intense and you get mm. that kind of uh, total absorption in the task. It really, uh, time flies by and it, it mm. flows. Um, and I, I, yeah, I completely love that. But it also, I don't know if you've, if you've ever watched or listened to this, but um, a few years ago, Brian Eno did the John Peel lecture um, and he talked about many things. Mm. Um, one of the things, one of the concepts that he introduced is the concept of senius. So not genius, which mm. is an individual mm. you know, giftedness, mm. but rather senius refers to the genius that resides in a collective or in a group when people come together. Oh, right. The, right, the right people at the right time. He's an interesting guy, isn't he? You know? He's fascinating. And he's yeah. speaking about you know what he did with Bowie and all that stuff. Um, and I, I think that in Vox sessions and in things like the Glasgow Songwriting Workshop, if you're lucky and if you land in the right group, what you get is a couple of days of being part of a little senius mm. where you're all sparking off each other and yeah. encouraging each other. And it really, it, I think it, it multiplies the productivity and the enjoyment um, in, in so many ways. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of, of, of trying to kind of find semi-organized uh, spaces and places to, to, mm. to get creative. They need to be open and flexible and leave people lots of room to go in whatever direction they choose. But mm. it, it really helps to have some kind of structure around that. Well, it, it, it's a structure, but it's also, it's also the freedom from everything else. Yeah. Exactly. A couple, couple of years ago, my wife bought me for a, for a Christmas present, a two day stand up comedy workshop. Uh -huh. And that was, that was really intense. Isn't it? I think a dozen of us in the group and we were there all the, all the Saturday and the Sunday on the Sunday night. Um, we did a, we, we, we did a stand up show met just mainly for the other people in the group, but also their partners. So it was a slightly augmented audience. And, um, at the end of it all, we, we all were on this what's what's up group. Yeah. Um, by lunchtime on the Monday, there were 370 messages on the WhatsApp group. Wow. Because big people were flying. It was like zing, zing, zing. It was amazing. Extraordinary yeah. experience. I so. can give you a, a word for that or a phrase for that from my day job. So uh, one of my favorite sociologists uh, is Emil Durkheim. Yeah. You might have heard of. And he, he coined the term collective effervescence yeah. to describe uh, – that way in which groups of people going through the same sort of rituals and processes can become energized and excited mm. uh, by by the interactions that they're experiencing, and that's yeah that 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 sounds exactly like it. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Excellent. We've got a few more comments here. Um, somebody here whose name I can't pronounce is it not booty not booty. Or was it pronounced differently? He says, listening to other songwriters about how they write, either at workshops or like this, is always invaluable, always something new to learn. Absolutely right, Tom. Yeah, that's why I enjoy doing it. And what else we've got? Yeah, and, and Heidi's agreeing with Tom. Yes, I always find it fascinating. And Melissa says, I see Stanley Brown behind you. Behind you. You do. <laughs> that's the, the, should I explain, maybe? I think maybe you should. <laughs> so, yeah, I brought, I brought the chair up. Um, so this might be the only song ever written about refurbishing a chair, but um, <laughs> this chair uh, used to sit in my office at the university and it was uh, kind of stained dark brown wood with uh, a, a fake leather covering. And uh, in, in, in the very boring days of the first lockdown, I decided it was time to get into furniture refurbishing. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. I'm never going to go back there. I have to say it was far too difficult. But I, I stripped it. Um, and when I stripped off the covers and took out all the felt and, and all the uh, packed horse hair and the hessian sacks and all these bits and pieces, I found on the wood uh, the name Stanley Brown and the date 5th of October 1962. And also a little cartoon face of a, right. a, what looked like a, a, a guy with a 1950s quiff. 
Right. Um, but it had been scored out, weirdly. And I wondered whether, in, in my imagination, Stanley wrote his name on the chair to sort of celebrate the fact that he'd finished it um, and, and also put it in there for posterity, maybe hoping that one day somebody would discover <laughs> it. And he drew a picture of himself, and then the foreman saw it and scored it yeah. out. So it was too, I don't know, juvenile. And I imagine that Stanley was an apprentice, but I have no idea, really. Anyway, I nice, I, nice story. I, I like that. I, lo I love it, and I, I love the chair. Um, I would sit on it and play right now, but in fact, it's incredibly squeaky, so it's not really <laughs> more for music. But um, I really enjoyed refurbishing it, and I loved the fact that he'd put put something of himself uh, re recorded his his, uh, his work there. So I just uh, wrote a song which kind of starts from the chair, and then imagines forward or tries to think about Stanley's life at that moment. Uh, in in 1962 and, and the, the date was also a gift because I looked it up on, on Wikipedia as you do mm. and 5th of October 1962 is the day that the Beatles released Love Me Do Wow! Um, it's also <laughs> the day that uh, the James Bond film Doctor No premiered in the cinema um, so it's a big day in, in the history of popular culture and there had to be a song in that So absolutely that's cracking I like that so I'll, I'll try and sing this one. Um, this is on the baritone guitar. Um, right, yes. Likes these technical things, although yeah. also with my fancy capo arrangement, um, which is too boring to try and ex <laughs> You wrote the date in pencil 5th October 62 Stanley Brown you signed it the day we first heard love me do you worked the wood with plain a chisel fashioned every piece to fit Hessian wrapped the horse hair smoothed the felt to soften it you held each tack and swung the hammer, fixed the cover into place. Even though your name lies hidden, what you made still carries weight. Your work was done that evening, 5th October 62. You asked a new girl to the salon, and she agreed to go with you. When the spy kissed Honey Rider, your arms slid round her chair. And before the house lights brightened, the path had changed for you and her And now the rest is history You set the course, you ran the race Even though your names lie hidden Love you made still carries weight The old world was collapsing in October 62. The long shadow of the Second War was hanging over all of you. You held your breath, you held each other, while cold warriors diced with death. But the only bombs exploding were the myths you laid to rest And I'm still sitting here In that chair you made As I try to slow this furious pace Even though your names lie hidden Your work still carries weight 
Even though your names lie hidden, your love still carries weight. Your work still carries weight. Excellent. I don't know why I put in those high notes. I mean, there's no need for it. <laughs> Could make things much easier. Yeah, I just think of the the. Um, I think we've got another one for you there, Trudy. Does that qualify as Zergma as well? It oh. still ca your name still carries weight. Hmm. Uh, I think, yeah, it's a dual usage. It is a see. dual usage, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. But one one's meta character in the sense that one is physical and one is metaphorical. Yeah. I think we'll go for that. I have a few more comments here. Mark Bullen, looking forward to your album, fella. It says. <laughs> well, uh, you might not be looking forward for a while, but you never know. You never know. <laughs> Tom's asking if it's if you've recently refurbished it, should it be squeaky? Yeah, that's a good uh, a good point. But I it obviously points you towards the guitar still, doesn't it? <laughs> leave, I, I, leave the upholstery. I preserved the original parts, so uh, with them came the squeaks. There you so, go. Yeah, there's got a there's a there's a, a kind of wire frame, which is what gives the chair its suspension and I I didn't know how to replace that so I left it and just covered it with a new a new piece of foam instead of what was uh Hesse and packed with horsehair. Unbelievable, you know, to the and also incredibly messy to take that apart and find I, I just find that so powerful to to kind of take apart something that somebody had put together uh, mm -hmm. all those years ago. Um and with such care and attention, the number of tacks. I think I took 400 tacks out of the chair. Um, and if you've ever watched the way that the way that uh, crafts people put tacks into chairs like that, they're I think they have magnetized hammers and they hold the tacks in their mouth. Mm. Amazing. All right. Amazing. Definitely an art form for sure. So. I, anyway. One of my one of my much treasured possessions is a is a chair that my grandfather made. My grandfather was a um, um, a blacksmith and a carpenter, oh. and um, he uh, he produced two, when they got married. He and my grandmother they made uh, he made two chairs for them, and uh, and it, it's still got one of the original cushions on it, which is made from duck down. Oh wow! And it weighs like half a hundred weight. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but it's also made of uh, it, it's it, they're both made of oak, and because it's of a certain era. It's very, it's very old oak, and it's got that, you know, those lovely sort of white marks you get in the grain. Yeah. You know, like sort of teardrops in it. It's beautiful chair. Beautiful. It's gorgeous. gorgeous. Um, right, what else we got here? Um, da, da, Trudy, I can see the chair. That's cute. Um, only if it's twice. Oh, yes, the Zergma. Yes, okay, still. Right. Um, <laughs> so what, what? when you actually um, – it's interesting so far that the songs you've talked about um, – um, the, the the starting point has always been the subject matter. Um, now, the, the question that everybody asks is, which came first, the words or the music? Yeah. It's, which... it, I mean, for me, it is usually words, mm. um, but not always. So Blood Rush, for example, um, I had um, the first little chord sequence. So this, <laughs> um, this is... Uh, one for the guitar geeks, but the the, the little half castle, yeah, um, is something that I had picked up from Chris Drever's guitar playing. He's a Scottish Orcadian folk musician, plays both solo and in the band Low. He's actually mm. tonight the the people who did the uh, Spell Songs album based on the Lost um, Lost Lost What book by Robert McFarlane. Uh, Lost. Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, he's a brilliant musician and guitar player, and I'd been watching him play, and uh, he he puts the the half capo on. Mm -hmm. you, usually, you put it on the um, A, D, and G strings to create a kind of open tuning like Dad Gad, but like Dad yeah. Gad. Mm -hmm. But if you put it on the other three, um, from D, G, and B, you get lovely sort of, An I don't know what a. they are, suspended um or augmented sounds uh in the mm. chords and i just saw him do that so I, I i put the capo on the guitar and just played um mm. and i got the opening bars of um 
the music of Blood Rush from that, and it it, it invoked a uh, the sound of those chords just invoked a sentiment that that fit fit with what I was thinking lyrically. Mm. All, all I had lyrically when I started with was this idea of the hectic, um, which was a line from a line from Hamlet, um, misused by me. So the line is, for like the hectic in my blood, he rages, and thou must cure me. And it's about um, madness. Uh, and I think it's about the desire for revenge. I can't remember who says it, but I think it's uh, after Hamlet has killed somebody uh a relative of the somebody that he's killed wants revenge. Anyway, it, I, I got me thinking about the word hectic, um, mm. which, which uh, I, I thought somewhere in the back of my mind that uh, the Greeks had the idea of hectic as a sort of something that was literally in the blood, like a, a, a powerful right. entity in the yeah. blood that had effects on mood. Um, and I like that idea that there's a kind of foreign presence which is producing powerful mental and emotional effects like like in falling in love so I, I i got the first line um have you ever met someone and felt the hectic stirring in your blood and it's the hectic capitalized so it's yeah not, it's not hectic stirring yeah it's the, the hectic, hectic yeah. stirring nice blood and uh and then the, the the words fell out uh from there and the chords fell out from the first few phrases um and again it was it was it was a song that was remarkably quickly written and more um, in a dialogue between the the chord structure and, and the lyrics than, than is usual for me. I'm, I am a, a kind of word-centred person, so quite mm. often I have words and then try and find music for them. Um, but uh, at that time, it was more symbiotic between the two. Mm. That's excellent. Yeah, I like that. The hectic, it's, it's, it's almost has a sort of Victorian sound to it as well because they were into those. Sort of yeah, it's like things. like the kind of um, I can't. I don't know enough about the history of medicine to have this conversation, but I, I remember there being ideas uh, about um, yeah. you know what the, the what what the what was causing illness and what was causing disease, uh, mm. and sometimes they were just imagined entities yeah. uh, to yeah. make sense of uh, observable the, the vapors yeah exactly exactly yeah. that so yeah. i just liked that and, and and ran with the idea of the hectic and then of course i looked it up later and discovered that uh, hectic is linked to the greek word hexis which is linked to ideas about habits which is linked mm. to addiction which is linked to all oh, right blood, okay and the rush in your blood which is what People who so basically, it's a song about drugs, is what you're saying. You can, it's it's, <laughs> it's sex, it's love, it's whatever you want it to be. <laughs> it all comes back to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Marvelous, oh, so it does, except for the, the absence of rock and roll. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on, what have we got here? Um, I love that McFarlane book, The Lost Words. That's Wonderful. the one, The Lost Words. And, and right. the album, the related album is called The Spell Songs. And if you're right. if you're online tonight at 8 o'clock and you Google that, they're doing a live performance of it from, I think it's from the Natural History Museum in London. And it will All right. be amazing. The album, uh, Spell Songs, is one of the most beautiful collections of songs I've I've heard for a long time. It's really gorgeous. There's a specific song on that record called Little Astronaut, which absolutely breaks my heart. It's the most beautiful, hmm. um, most beautiful thing. So I thoroughly recommend Spell Songs. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm writing lots of things down here. Right? <laughs> I feel like he, I've got homework. Marvellous. Um, that's brilliant. So what's this song then? Right, so I, I've lost I, track. Is this the third or the fourth? This is the fourth and last. <laughs> you know, I've, I've only rehearsed four. <laughs> I thought that this one was interesting from a songwriting point of view because it's, I think it's the first song that I wrote, which I recognized as a song. Like, you know, when you, when you, when you write something <laughs> and it falls out of your head onto mm. the page and you listen to it and you think, I think I might have written a song. And this was the first time I had that feeling. Mm. Um, and uh, it was back in 2013, I think. Um, Right at the beginning of everything, and uh, I was, I was doing the thing with the words where I was trying to kind of get deep into a personal experience, and um, and convey it in a way which might also be universal, you know, mm. so to connect. 
and I went back to a happy memory of you know the perfect family holiday. So everybody, <laughs> everybody has one if they're lucky. Mine was 1976, and the song, mm. this song is currently called "No Fear." Mm. Brackets 1976, and it's uh, we. My dad, um, when I was very young, uh, brought home a, a Comer van. If you remember those. Yeah, and, I, dro- I drove them. Uh, and he cut, cut holes in the side, and uh, he built a camper van from scratch. And then for the rest of our childhood, we drove that van everywhere, mostly in the in the West Highlands of Scotland, but also as far as the Dolomites um, and the Alps. And uh, I think we were in Spain once as well. So we the, the van travelled a long way over many years. But the happiest Excellent. memory in the van is uh, the island of Barra, which is mm. at the southern tip of the Outer Hebrides, about as far west as you can go without mm. going to America. Um, and we were on, there's a, there's a promontory on Barra uh, with two beaches. The east beach is also the airport, so they land planes on that beach, and it faces back towards the mainland. And then the west beach, you look, you look west, and there's nothing between you and America except uh, St Kilda, the famous island, mm. that was the last... Um, you know where the people were taken off in the mm. in the early twentieth century. So we had three weeks in a van in a heat wave on the most perfect beach, two miles of of white sand. And I I decided to kind of go back to that memory. I'm going to show you this picture. This probably won't work very well. Yeah. All right, yeah. So that's my mum, my big sister, my big brother, and me. And my dad obviously took the photo. So. <laughs> I started off this time not by writing lyrics, but by writing a poem. So I'll, re- I'll read you the poem and then I'll play yeah. the song. Excellent. So the poem's called um, 1976, Orange Canvas, Green Melamine. Uh, we travelled to the edge of the world in a van as white as the sun that shone fierce and generous. We were three weeks above the dunes, beneath the stars. The long sands of Triash were our deserted kingdom. The driftwood and detritus, our tools and trinkets, our shoe-free feet ran from shore to steep, from stir to sleep, our salt sand hair bleached blonde on limb and neck and head, marked us our own heroes, castaway survivors, stationed on the beach grass parapets of our shifting castles. We looked to America, but courted no rescue. Raiding our mobile larder, we ate from green melamine bowls, breads and cereals, sickly and sticky with condensed milk, tins of everything with ladles of smash, the sweetness of the instant whip delighting the angels. And when we wearied, spent by the lightness of our joy, we crawled into stitched up sheets laid out under orange canvas, wriggling like earthworms, burrowing into sleep and dreaming of abandon and adventure, but courting no rescue. So that, that was the poem. And, Love uh, it. And then I... Angel's I, Delight, marvellous. And Instant Whip. I got them both and in the same Instant life. Whip, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> also on, on Talent is Timeless, there's a, a thread on giving an old song some new love. Yeah. So this, I thought, I'll, I'll go back to my oldest recognisable song. Hmm. I haven't played for years. I'm trying mm. to give it some new love. Now, the tricky thing here is I've changed it from 4-4 four, four to 3-4, and I'm mm. not very good at rhythm, so let me just... Okay. We rode out to the world's edge In a van as white as sun for three long weeks above the dunes we were free to run and run on the long sands of triage the driftwood fueled our plane the beach grasses were the parapets of the castles that we made we were cast away on an island lost at sea Bleached blonde and shoeless With no fear for what might be 
with no fear for what might be. We sought no rescue from our respite. We asked no one to save our souls. Only the hourglass was the enemy. The sand was slipping through the holes. And when we all grew weary from carrying a load so light, we burrowed deep like earthworms. We dreamed our way through night. We were cast away on an island lost at sea, bleached blonde and shoeless, with no fear for what might be, with no fear for what might be. We were cast away heroes on an island lost at sea, bleached blonde and shoeless, with no fear for what might be, with no fear for what might be, with no fear. For what may be great, lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. I tell you, it's, it's funny, one of the things that I, I usually ask him. I was musicians, which which I've not got around to asking you as yet. We've been talking so, so many other different topics. Um, favorite musicians? Uh, yeah. Um, I'll give you a little trajectory that that, that might make sense. So, um, actually, we mentioned David Bowie earlier, and I mm. think my my first sort of musical memories and and influences came from my big sister mainly and my big brother. So that was David Bowie, Led Zeppelin, and Queen. Hmm. And uh, once I once I got into them, I was very loyal for a while. was was quite sort of heavy rock into the nineteen eighties. But I had a uh, my first girlfriend uh, was a big fan of the Mamas and the Papas and Simon hmm. and Garfunkel and Billy Bragg, and hmm. so she was quite a big influence. And then Billy Bragg, the kind of political song thing, took me into folk music. Um, hmm. And uh, there's a, a great Scottish artist um, called Dick Gochan. Um, who who I, I I I heard his music for the first time in the kind of early to mid eighties and loved it and and began began to fall in love with folk music through that record. Um, mm. The Water Boys, I guess, were the kind of more popular version of that at the time. Mm. Um, I I had a massive thing for the Indigo Girls for about ten years. They're an American uh, band. If you don't know them, uh, two mm. women singers who who sing with the most beautiful harmonies again often songs which are political spiritual certainly kind of socially conscious and so from what you're saying it's it's the mamas and the papas meet belly brack yeah and then it, <laughs> it moved i was thinking that was that was an, an odd combination that you put together before yeah. i thought that's great i love that well, there's, a kind of, there's a sort of melodic quality but there's also like from belly brag it was more like what can you do with a song that, mm. that is uh what can a song say that's important? Not mm. not just um, not just expressive or reflective, but important in some wider sense of the word. Um, anyway, more recently, it's it's folk music in in mm. and a lot of Scottish artists. Chris Trever, I I absolutely love his music. Um, and my favourite band of the moment, um, slightly weirdly, is uh, Admiral Fallow, who are a Scottish indie band. Um, and Louis, who is the lead singer of Admiral Fallow, Louis Abbott plays drums in Chris Drever's band because nice. he's also a percussion genius and he's also uh, heavily involved in the in the music project in prisons and is a right. brilliant uh, brilliant songwriter and 
and worker in that context as well. So, yeah, lots of different influences, but mostly kind of folk and uh, Americana. Mm. Uh, at the moment, I'm I'm loving Bonnie Light Horseman, which is an Aeneas Mitchell thing. Uh, yeah, they're they're definitely worth looking up. Um, yeah, there's 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 lots of great stuff. Um, but yeah, mostly in the sort of folk. Uh, yeah side of, of things nowadays yeah it's quite it's interesting that with, i mean certainly when um so sort of 10 years before you you're talking about 76 10 years before that i mean the, the amount of music that was available was much much less i mean there is so much more just out there yeah um these days um and, and i think as a result of it i know this is something i've said before is that we hear a lot more music than we listen to yeah that's you know, true, and, yeah. I still feel though I haven't listened to enough to write well. <laughs> That's what I, <laughs> you know, that um, especially when when I get into conversation with professional musicians and songwriters about music, I realise mm. the amount of listening that they've done and the mm. care the care with which they've listened is what gives them such enormous repertoires not just technically but also imaginatively and i, uh, I you know yeah. there were years there were times in my life when there wasn't much music around like when my kids were babies mm. um, I, I barely listened to music and i barely played for for a few years because life was just so chaotic and um, so i've got gaps in my mm. you know in, like it, I, I know scottish music probably better than anything else but even then <laughs> i don't know much from the late 90s to the late noughties because... Well, Spotify did some research a few years ago, and they were saying that most people's musical taste stops when they reached thirty-three. Well, I'm st I'm still maturing. That's good to know. <laughs> Twenty years on from thirty-three, I'm still <laughs> developing. Uh, yeah, but it is it is difficult. I mean, the 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 scope of what's out there to listen to, and the fact that we have instant access to to world the the world of music, if you like. Yeah. Um, I don't mean world music in that sense, but you know, um, it's all, whereas you know, in the in the seventies, what what was happening in the states and what was happening in Britain were entire in many ways unrelated. Although we did we did have things. I mean, if you listen to talking to people like um, um, like in people in Pink Floyd and Genesis and bands like that, particularly Pink Floyd, um, they were doing what they thought what was going on in San Francisco. And the yeah. people in San Francisco are thinking, "Wow, what's going on over in on in Britain?" Yeah. And yeah. then you had the blues boom in the '60s, where the the, the Brits were actually re-exporting the blues over to to uh, to America. I mean, I know I've told this story before about Keith Richards. Um, <laughs> was in an interview, he was saying that when he first went to the the States with the Stones, there were all these. Uh, kids saying yeah wow where does this music come from man and Keith Richards is going well <laughs> just down the road <laughs> we've taken it over there and brought it back um, whereas now it is it is all instantly available and talking of things being instantly available you have a new website as well don't you which I shall, I I shall put up yeah because you were telling me that you're going to um catalog the uh, um the uh, the the story of the, of the recording a long and winding road, if that's not too <laughs> easy. Uh, I think it's been yeah. done. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe. But I, you yeah, know, I, I decided to set up this site, which is a kind of, it's partly a, a, a place to share music, um, mm. but it's also uh, a blog. So I'm going to mm. blog about about songs of my own, but also mainly, I think, about the process of of taking Blood Rush to Abbey Road and and seeing. Seeing what happens along mm. the, along the way, so that that's why I got that set up. I thought it would be a fun thing to do. Um, so, yeah, there's that. There's also there's, there's a YouTube channel which has got a few live demos on it. You'll recognise the backdrop because this is it, um, <laughs> um, and a few songs on SoundCloud. Um, and that's about it for the moment. If anybody if anybody's looking for stuff, um, that song I just played, incidentally, um, is gonna be up on the youtube channel on sunday morning it's just uh, mm. i'm going to blog about it or i'll write a blog about it as well and post that on sunday so excellent yeah. excellent well fergus it's been an absolute delight i've thoroughly enjoyed myself it, it's it's flown it's flown away this time um 
Um, this is <laughs> this is probably one of the longest ones we've done, actually. Really good. Lovely to talk to you. Um, best of luck with uh, Abbey Road and the single and uh, all the other things that will come after that. I'm sure. Thanks to everybody who's um, who's who's called in and had a listen to us. And um, thanks to Trudy and Nev and Mark and uh, who else have I got? Um, Melissa and Elizabeth and um, and Leslie Jones, who's my wife, who's downstairs working hard as well, doing the same thing. Um, so, yeah, absolute pleasure, Fergus. Um, best of luck with it all. Thanks for coming and, and, and chatting to me and um, keep in touch. Thanks a million. It's been fun. Good. Good, excellent. That's what we like to hear. Fun. That's what we need at the moment, I think. Um, so that's it from me for this week. Um, next week, I've got Steve O'Donoghue on. And um, thanks to everybody who dropped in tonight. Uh, lots of nice comments, lots of participation. And I know it's a conversation going on between two people who I know don't know each other. Um, and they've only met here, Trudy and Heidi. Um, well, I'm assuming they don't know each other, haven't they? Hmm. Um, anyway, I, if more of that would be great. So um, thanks to everybody for, for joining in. We're, we're now up to about 120-odd thousand viewers, um, which is good, heading for our 50th episode in, uh, I think it's the end of June we'll reach that. So in the meantime, look after yourselves. Um, keep listening to music. If you like playing music, keep playing music. And if you're writing music, keep writing music. And um, stay safe. Okay, take care. Are you still there? Ah, good. <laughs> thought maybe you'd gone, but that's okay. Yeah, hang on. We're still, oh, hang on. We're still on air. <laughs> <laughs>